After my last film about Lady Wimborne's private road, two things happened that I didn't expect. One, nobody complained about me swearing when I crashed my bike into a bramble bush. I was going to bleep it out, but left it in. And two, I got a lot of positive comments, so thank you all for that. Tell a lie, a chap called Roger Bethel posted some lovely comments and came up with the term bikeumentary, which I rather like. So many thanks, Roger, and this bikeumentary is in your honour. People also suggested new routes to ride and stories to tell. One of the suggestions was Longfleet Drive, which I touched on last time. Looking at old Ordnance Survey maps has always fascinated me. I was looking at the 1900 map of Pool and noticed that an area next to the Civic Centre was called Brown Bottom. So that was that. Decision made. It would be rude not to include Brown Bottom. What I'm going to do with this film is to use the 1900 Ordnance Survey map to follow the road from the Civic Centre to the 1900 town boundary, then Longfleet Drive to Cantra Magna. I'm going to compare what was along the route in 1900 with what's there today. Starting at Brown Bottom, <laughs> which I'm never going to say without laughing. This trip splits into two halves and the first part takes us from the Civic Centre past the Shah and New Inn to the point where Derby's Lane was cut in two by the dual carriageway. Okay, so back in 1900 when um, the map we're using was made, Civic Centre to the right didn't exist. The old town hall used to be the Guild Hall, which I think is a much nicer building. But there is a reason I'm going around this walk the one way system. And the reason we're going around this gyratory is this. Where number one walk is, that's Brown Bottom Corner. So two things I didn't know that I got from looking at the 1900 map. One, the whole brown bottom thing. I've absolutely no idea of why or how it's called that, so if anyone knows, please tell me. And two, Poole had a tramway system. It ran from Poole Railway Station to County Gates at Westbourne, where it joined up with the Bournemouth tramway system. This is brown bottom corner stop. The Civic Centre was just grass in 1900. There was another line from Westbourne straight along Ashley Road and down North Road to the Brown Bottom Stop and the depot was on Ashley Road where Waitrose is now. So this is a bit of a steep hill. you have to excuse the wheezing of an old man riding up it. None of the houses on the left and the right existed. We know this stretch is Fernside Road but in 1900, yep, you guessed it. It was called Brown Bottom Road. Fernside Avenue on my right didn't exist. Churchfield Road on my left, uh, that was actually called Lover's Walk. Riverland Road on my right, uh, didn't exist, it was a track. Now, to my left were the filter beds and storage tanks of the Pool and District Water Company. Shah of Persia, as far as I can tell, has been called the Shah of Persia forever. Okay, so this section takes us between the Shah and the New Inn. All of the houses around us didn't exist in 1900. The nearest houses uh, were on the left, and that was Garden Road. St Mary's Road coming up, that was called Lime Kiln Lane. Hunt Road on the right, that was uh, not actually marked, but where the St Mary's Primary School is today uh, is a sandpit. Fernside Road itself uh, wasn't called Brown Bottom Lane or Brown Bottom Road or anything to do with Brown Bottoms. It was called Breakheart Lane. The only building on my left was a place called Denby Lodge. Um, in our front garden, there's a bit of steel and concrete that used to be their boundary fence, and it's got a lovely crop of bindweed growing on it. Jolly Road we're coming up to was called Leicester Road and a quick pit stop to talk about Pound Lane. So this is Pound Lane. On this spot, stray cattle from the surrounding farms were impounded. On the 1900 map, it doesn't have a name, but this old photograph uses a name. And it was literally that, just a lane. Okay, continuing on, it's just a short hop now to, to the new inn. And the only houses along here the Hennings Farm, which is on the right, the white building. And there were three Lady Wimbledon cottages. That was it. 
Um, the new inn was there, and uh, that's been called the new inn for, well, forever, really. But it's not exactly new, though, is it? A bit like the new forest. Derby's Lane is still called Derby's Lane and follows the same path as it did in 1900. The houses all around me have grown up since then. To my left, there was nothing but farmland between me and Holes Bay. And to my right, just uh, Pope's Farm and a few houses at Oakdale Road. This section takes us to the uh, part where Derby's Lane has been split into two by the dual carriageway. Right, so we start this stretch of the journey from a lovely dual carriageway. Okay, so we've just passed the Reliant Scrap Metal on the left and the Dump Horse on the left. And this is the end of Derby's Lane North. Now we're just approaching a small cottage with some significance. It's nice to see they've kept the name Longfleet Lodge. Okay, the significance of this is that in 1900, it was right on the border between Poole and the Camford Estate. And as you see, it's in the traditional Lady Wimborne style. The next bit is a short hop to Camford Heath Road, but there's nothing left of the original route. As you can see from this rather convenient graphic, the Nuffield Estate's built right on top of it. So we have to skirt around the edge. So now's a good time to elaborate on Longfleet Lodge. Poole was part of the Camford Estate until 1248, when the Lord of the Manor signed the Longsby Charter. The Charter granted some freedoms from the feudal rule of the Manor. He didn't do it out of the goodness of his heart. He sold freedom to the Burgesses of Poole to raise cash for his trips to the Crusades. Two years later, in 1280, on his second crusade, he managed to get himself killed in Egypt. So that in front of us is Camford Heath Road. Okay, so you've come out the underpass and you come on to a feature I didn't know existed until I start riding. This road is red brick. Um, I guess it was put there by the developers in the 70s when they were building um, Tolliford Road on the left and Colourford Crescent on the right. But it goes for about a mile from Camford Heath Road to the edge of the houses. Unfortunately, it's uphill most of the way. Very pleasant on a day like this, so. End of the Red Brick Road. Now that's also the end of Camford Heath housing. We're at a bit of open clearing where several paths meet. First off, I thought this was Longfleet Lodge. But I was talking crap. So from this rough bit of ground, what we've got is several routes. That's the Red Brick Road down to Longfleet Lodge. We've just come up. That one goes to uh, another part of the heath. That one there, that takes you up to Magna Road. And we're going up there in a second. And that one there takes you over to the crematorium in Broadston. This section takes us from the end of the houses of Canford Heath to the church at Canford Magna. From this point, there's multiple ways across the heath, but we're going to try and stick as close as we can to Longfleet Drive. So it's this way. Hello, doggy. Dog seems to like me for some reason. <laughs> Cheers. One of the things that started me um, researching the Camford Estate uh, was this road. My daughter and I were going up to the crematorium on a different ride and we looked at this road and wondered if it was an abandoned railway line. Then we worked out it was actually part of the Wimborne Estate Road. Looks rather like an old railway line, doesn't it? Oh, and this is where it gets steep. Pity the horses that had to pull carts this way. Okay, so this is still the original route of Longfleet Drive. But we come across one dirty great big obstacle. It's called White's Tip. So that's the original route of the drive. But we're going to have to go this way. And if you thought the tip looks bad today, it used to look like this. Thankfully, it's since been filled and landscaped. So it's worth pausing here a minute. So pool is that direction. We're going to slow pan round. That's going to be Broadston and that's heading towards Wimborne and that's a tip. 
there is another path around the tip and that goes to the right of it that's actually the easiest ride but this one is the closest to the original route and you never see anyone on it either let's bring the drone up here one day and not film the tip this bit's still the same public path but it's interesting on a bike actually the thing i should point out is this is rhododendron drive if you come down here in the sort of uh, springtime there's absolutely gorgeous Whoa. oh <laughs> don't like hills no, no. Railway track. Fantastic. yeah you're trying to find the railway track <laughs> good luck with that <laughs> i think they're a little bit lost i think what they're trying to do is find the road Oh, this is where we walk. Somebody more intrepid might ride down here, but I value the use of my limbs, so we walk. Oh gold, I've got this a steep bit. Uh, we walk. Okay, so uh, the original route used to be to the right. I think we're just past the dump. Narrow Smith Road's on the left. Oh. Hmm, uh, steep bit. Yeah, no, I know I'm a wuss. Hopefully, shouldn't need to get off it now. So we're definitely back on long feed drive now. So for anyone that saw the last film, this point is where the paths diverge. To the right, that's the one which goes up to Bournemouth on the road that they built. And the left is the path to, it looks like they've cut this down a bit. Yeah, somebody's been cutting this down. I think it was more fun when there were brambles. I think they've even cut this bit down. Well, we got to see it when it was uh, a forest. Ah, oh, stupid bike. Yeah. Just does it, it's old like me. <laughs> Cheers. Okay, here we go. So we're on familiar territory now. So this is a gatehouse. That's the grounds of Camford School, but once upon a time it was uh, Lady Wimborne's Manor House. Yeah, let's go on a bit. And once again, we've got the village of Camford Magna. Lovely old thatched cottages again. Last time we stopped by, this one was for sale for 465,000. I notice it's now sale agreed. Okay, so we're going to end this film with an apology. In the last film, I said that this church dated back to the 16th century. Now the rector's written into me saying, in fact, it goes back to Saxon times and before. So I'm happy to correct that. I think my next trip is going to be the Castleman Trailway. Now, if anyone's got any ideas, I'm happy for suggestions.